City Club reports are written by our volunteer members who are screened for conflict of interest before they are appointed to serve on one of the research committees. Study, volunteer, study volunteers research uh, available information and interview experts on all sides of an issue before they uh, rec make recommendations to the club. You who represent the entire City Club membership now have the opportunity to discuss, debate, and vote to accept or reject the committee's report. Voting cards were distributed at the door to City Club members. If you do not have a card and would like one, please raise your hand and staff will get you one. Copies of the report are available on your table and on the information table at the entrance. Uh, club members should have all received copies in the mail with their, this week's bulletin. Meredith Savory, chair of the committee, will present the report. The committee is unanimous in its recommendations, and thus there is no minority report. When Meredith is completed with her summary, she will move for approval of the study, and the meeting will be open for debate and comment from City Club members in the audience. The membership vote to adopt the report will follow. Please be reminded that City Club members only will be allowed to participate in the discussion, in the debate, and in the vote. Let me also add that we always welcome new members, and application materials are available at the back entrance door. Uh, near the door. Before I introduce Meredith, let me review the club's bylaws and report votes. You will find copies of the bylaws on your table. The following motions are, are allowed. First, to accept or reject individual report recommendations. Second, to postpone further consider consideration to a subsequent meeting, which is a debatable motion requiring a two-thirds majority for adoption. To postpone, third, is to postpone consideration of the report indefinitely which also requires a two-thirds majority vote. Uh, Chris Smith, uh, who's seated here at the front table, will serve as our parliamentarian today. Um, now I'll turn the podium over to Meredith Savory, who will present an overview of the report and its recommendations. Thank you. Good afternoon. Before I start, I'd like to introduce the members of my committee, um, who last time I looked were all from planet Earth. Um, <laughs> Richard Meyer, Chris Angel, Jim Gorder, Ruby Apsler, Kit Ketchum, and our research, one of our research advisors, Gil Johnson. Uh, Pauline Anderson, our other research advisor, couldn't be here today, and there are a couple of other committee members who also are not here. Um, I also want to acknowledge a couple of, of guests in the audience. Um, Chief Tom Potter, former Chief Tom Potter, is in the rear of the room. And ne sitting next to him is Jane Brayton, who is the uh, Director of Planning and Support for, for the Police Bureau. She was extremely helpful to us in our information gathering um, stage, and um, I'm glad, very glad she's here today. Uh, also here is a full table of people, crime prevention specialists from the Office of Neighborhood Involvement, and I'm very glad to see you as well. So. Um, in 2001, when the Research Board of City Club selected the topic of community policing for a study, it was because of the general sense that community policing, which had been introduced and promoted with so much enthusiasm in the late 1980s and early 1990s, had sort of fallen off the radar screen. The intent of the study was to, check, was to do a check on what had happened to community policing in the 12 or 13 years since City Council passed its authorizing and implementing resolutions. We went back to those resolutions and started from there. Our recommendations, which I hope you've seen in the report, are addressed primarily to City Council, to the Mayor, and to the Police Chief. And they will decide which of our recommendations, if any, they want to respond to. For today, however, um, I'd like to identify five points that we, the committee, hope that you, the members and members of the public, uh, will take away from this report. And then when I'm finished with that, I'd like to answer the question, so what is the status of community policing today? The first point that we want you to remember is, is that what distinguishes community policing from traditional law enforcement is two principles. The first of those principles is taking a problem-solving approach to public safety issues. That is, that when a public safety issue arises, the first question is not, who should I arrest, but what's the problem and what are my options for solving it? 
The second principle of community policing is developing partnerships between the police bureau, other parts of city, county, and state government, uh, businesses, nonprofit organizations, and neighborhood associations. So that when a public, sa public safety issue is being addressed, the options include working with other partners for solutions. The police bureau and the city as a whole subscribe to these two principles. To quote Chief Croker, this is in one of the, I think it's the introduction to the strategic planning document, quote, community policing relies on a problem-solving partnership between citizens and police. These partners jointly and identify community safety issues, determine resources, and apply innovative strategies, close quote. The second point that we want you to remember is a corollary of the first, and that is that community policing is not solely the responsibility of the police. Other parts of government, from the neighborhood associations to the city bureaus to the courts and district attorneys, also must be organized to support and to work with the police, and they must be held accountable by city council for community policing successes and failures. The third point that we'd like you to remember is that community policing requires an ongoing investment in organizational development, particularly within the police force. Problem solving approaches and partnership building are not the natural inclination of young people who decide to become police officers. They have to be trained in the techniques of problem solving and partnership building. Community policing practices must be constantly reinforced not only by the structure of the Bureau, which prioritizes neighborhood services, but also by personnel practices, recruiting, training, 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 um, evaluation procedures, promotion policies that reward community policing, rewards themselves, which recognize community policing su uh, successes, and discipline policies that support community policing. As a former um, assistant chief told us, uh, community policing is like physical fitness. You have to keep working at it or it goes away because it's not the natural trend, or the natural inclination of uh, people in police work. The, the fourth point is a corollary of the third, and that is that budget cuts are chipping away at the internal structures that maintain community policing. Investment in organizational development within the police bureau has been affected, as have crime prevention activities that originate in the Office of Neighborhood Involvement. Also, the community courts and the district attorney program have been drastically curtailed. Without adequate resources, community policing may still be the police bureaus and the city's philosophy on paper, but its implementation will be severely compromised. And then our fifth and final point, which we'd like you to take away from this, has to do with minority representation on the force. As a percentage of the population, minorities have increased from 15% uh, in 1990, 1990 to 20% to, yeah, to 20 in, the, in 2000. And that increase has continued uh, since, since 2000. Minority representation on the police force is nowhere near those percentages. For community policing partnerships and for effective problems, problem solving, it is essential that minorities be much better represented on the force than they are now. So those are the five points. So what is the status of community policing? In our view, the community policing philosophy is very compatible with Portland's culture of strong neighborhoods and citizen involvement. The principles of community policing, part, par partnerships and problem solving, are, are widely articulated and understood and to a considerable extent integrated into the practices of the police and the community. But many of our witnesses felt that the commitment to community policing from the city's leadership had weakened, and that partnerships and relationships between the police and other entities were not what they used to be. As noted above, we also have substantial concerns about budget cuts and about their effect on the need for continuous organizational development within the police bureau. We would suggest that the city and the police bureau think of this report as a wake-up call. We believe that community policing is the right philosophy for Portland, and we recommend that the leadership at City Council and the Police Bureau make every effort to be visible and audible advocates of the community policing vision and its effective implementation. Thank you very much. I move adoption of the report.
Thank you, Meredith. We will now take comments in support of and against the motion to adopt the report and its recommendations. The microphone to my left is labeled for and the one to my right is labeled against. I'll try to alternate between the two positions and we will first recognize someone favoring the report. Again, City Club members only may debate the report and please li limit your comments to two minutes so others may speak as well. So. Yeah, Cy Corn Road City Club member. I just, I am in favor of the report. I think that the committee did a very good job on the report. However, I have two questions and they are not kind of thing that should be fatal to the <laughs> push of the report. Number one is I spent almost 40 years in the crime business and I, mostly in parole and probation, but on the adult side, but I'm a special agent with the Treasury, I've done other things. And what I want to know is, in all those years, crime has gone down when the at-risk cohort of 17 to 29 population has gone down, and it has gone up as that population has increased. And, you know, I know I'm not disparaging working with kids and who are at risk, but that still happens, and there should be something saying that because it gives a false picture. The other one is the culture in a lot of militaristic organizations, corrections, police, um, comes is that no matter, from middle management up, no matter what is said, everything feeds into what they think the perceptions of the chief, of the chief are. I know the chief, I know he wants to hear it how it is, but that's a very difficult culture to get around. Thank you. You can answer those. <coughs> Erwin Mandel, City Club member, member of the District Attorney's Citizens Budget Advisory Committee, founding member of Westside Community Court, and also alternate member of the Chief's Forum. I hate being against this report, having spent uh, a lot of time on a research report myself, the, the City Club's Affordable Housing. I know the amount of work that went into it. I have to compliment the Chair and the Research Committee for the amount of work. However, I think there are some fatal flaws. One deals with the nature and functioning of the Chief's Forum. I see you managed to interview one member of the forum, and only one member. I suggest you might have interviewed, gotten uh, several opinions from the members of the forum themselves about the functioning. I'd also point out to you that the forum itself is open for public comment at the beginning and end of each meeting. It's held regularly twice a month. Yes, the chief does have other obligations, attending uh, meetings internationally, nationally, so it isn't that clockwork. But in general, I think that forum functions just fine. It is a two-way communication, despite what this one member of the forum may have said. Uh, the other issues that I have to deal with, perhaps the best summarized as, if we don't pass a ballot measure, and the state does not provide more money for the justice system, we're going to go down the tubes very quickly. Uh, the neighborhood west side, the west side neighborhood DA's position that you praise so highly, the neighborhood DA, has been abolished. No money to fund it. It is non-existent. It's a position I've worked with quite often. Community courts have contracted. Two of them, as you point out in the report, are no longer located in the neighborhood. They must come downtown. In essence, And also the, okay, I'm finished. <laughs> Thank you, Erwin. Not really, but I have to stop talking. Well, do we have other comments for or against this report? Okay. I'm, I'm here right. mainly because it's near. All right, then we'll. Four. <laughs> Thank you. What I'm yes, trying right. to say is we met the enemy and it's us. <laughs> I'm Gil Johnson, and I, uh, I'm a city club member and uh, was the research director uh, for this report, which I have been on the research board for two years, and I've never seen more effort put into a report than this one. So it was a, a lot of effort 
they interviewed, I just want to respond to Irwin's one comment here. They interviewed one person there. They went out on the street. Every committee member went on a ride along with a cop. Every committee, they, they interviewed people from the, the people involved on the street, Office of Neighborhood Involvement. There was an enormous amount of contact with the people who actually have to deal with crime at the, at the local level. And uh, that's what gives a substance for the um, conclusions we reach and the recommendations we, uh, that the report uh, <coughs> proposes. So that, I don't know what your second point seems to support us, so uh, I'm not going to respond to that one. Sure. Uh, to Gil, a f real friend of mine. Uh, oh, we are. Uh, I didn't criticize the general interviewing of what you did. My criticism was directed to the evaluation of the Chiefs Forum based on a listed interview with only one member of a forum that has, I believe, about 12 to 15 people representing a wide variety of constituencies in this city. It wasn't about whom else you interviewed, but particularly just from Chiefs Forum. Thank you. Thank you. Mike. I'm Mike Ponder. I'm a City Club member and uh, a recovering sociologist. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I have done consulting work on community policing and done evaluation work in other parts of the country. I would tell you that this report is excellent, extremely well done. And the most important part of it is that we know community policing thrives when leaders in communities and community organizations demand, suggest, recommend how important it is. And so I think it's important that the City Club issues this report, even if there are flaws of some kind to help kick the process in the pants. Thank you. Are there other comments for or against this report? If one more. Great. Lily. Hi. I'm having a problem. Uh, Lily Mandel member. Uh, I think you did a lot of work and I think you should be praised. Uh, I agree with part of it, uh, the Multnomah County District Attorney, I'm definitely you're right on. Uh, it felt too much that uh, too much blame was put onto the mayor and to uh, Chief Croker. That's the way I felt about it. I, I'm very much for uh, community policing. I think it's wonderful and I agree with it. But I think there was just a little too much blame put there. Thank you. Yes. Larry Hildebrand, City Club member. I'm a recovering editorial writer for the Oregonian. <laughs> <laughs> I've had the advantage of uh, watching the evolution of community policing since its inception when Tom Potter, and actually to some extent before that with the uh, Multnomah County Sheriff's Office and Don Clark. And I think this report is outstanding. I think that what it says is that community policing doesn't just start like with a bang. It evolves. And Portland is evolving and has been excellent in that evolution for a long time. The report is, as it's stated, a wake-up call to remind our city leaders that there's much more to be done, and some of that which has been done has been relaxed too much. So I would hope that the city officials to whom this is directed, to the community at large, which I think is more important as a target for this report, would look upon it as a helping tool. The, the, the mayor and others should not be defensive about this. They should be asking themselves, what can we learn from this report and how can we move forward? And I would hope the city club membership would push that for agenda. Thank you. I'm Kit Ketchum, committee club member, our city club member and member of the committee as well. And I'd like to answer the question about our interviewing um, 
Chiefs Forum members. It was not necessary to interview Chiefs Forum, Chiefs Forum members. It's on television. A number of us watched it and do our conclusions from those from watching that program. Thank you. Do I hear a motion to uh, call the question? Or do I hear a question? Call the calls? question. All right, thank you. We'll now proceed to vote on whether to adopt the report and its recommendations. Those in favor of adopting the report and its recommendations, please raise your voting cards. All those opposed? I think the motion carries. Our thanks to Meredith and all the members of this uh, study committee for an excellent report. I want to add the Chief of Police, Croker, wished to be here today, but this program conflicts with a long-standing appointment on his calendar, the annual uh, police memorial ceremony for officers killed in the line of duty and their families. Nonetheless, Chief Coker did send the club a response to the report, and I'll read you the first paragraph of that uh, letter. He said, thank you for the interest that your members and specifically the community policing committee have shown toward community policing and public safety in Portland. I'm writing to let you know that some of the information presented needs clarification and some of the recommendations need follow-up. I look forward to working with your members and leadership from the community and the police bureau on many of your recommendations. Uh, the City Club appreciates the chief resp Chief's response and we look forward to working with the Police Bureau in the future on this issue. I have just a few more announcements before we begin the main part of our program. Join us next Friday, the 16th, for our program featuring Gloria Felt, the National President of Planned Parenthood. We'll be back at the Multnomah Athletic Club for that meeting. Last Friday, May 2nd, City Club members voted overwhelmingly to approve the membership resolution supporting ballot measure 2648. The membership resolution was introduced by Chris Smith and Marcus Samantle. This resolution was referred by that vote of the uh, membership to the Board of Governors, which last week gave it unanimous approval. So now the City Club's formal position is therefore a yes vote on ballot measure 2648. Before we proceed with our main program, I want to acknowledge the presence of a special guest in our audience today. He was Speaker of the House 50 years ago this year and was president of the City Club in 1960 and 61. And he's since then served in leadership positions in countless other Portland institutions. Please give a special round of applause to Rudy Wilhelm. Is Rudy Wilhelm here? There we go. There we go. We very much appreciate your presence here today. Our board host today is Katie King, member of the Board of Governors. Katie is an Intergovernmental Relations Liaison for Health Services in the Department of Health Services. Uh, she is also the author of City of Suspects, a mystery novel to be published, published here in September. Katie will ask the first question of our speaker, and then following Katie's question, we will open the program to questions from City Club members present in the audience. Please line up behind the microphone even before Katie is finished so there'll be enough time for everyone to ask questions. Please identify yourself as a member and ask your question. The broadcast of City Club programs this quarter is made possible in part from support from the following corporate sponsors, Wells Fargo Bank, Weyerhaeuser Community Foundation or Company Foundation, and Legacy Health Systems. We thank them for their support. We welcome today Speaker of the House Karen Minnis, who is serving her third term in the legislature, representing a district that covers uh, various towns and, and uh, unincorporated parts of Multnomah County, East Multnomah County. In previous terms, she served as chair of the Ways and Means Subcommittee on Education and Public Safety, and she has twice served on the Emergency Board. Representative Minnis was born and raised in Portland, and before being elected to her first term in 1998, she served six terms as legislative assistant to her husband, Representative John Minnis, who is now the state senator from District 25. I think Representative Minnis must be one of the busiest people in Oregon these days, and we appreciate her taking her time from the session to share with us her perspective on the news from the Capitol. Thank you. Thank you for having me here today. It's nice to see some familiar faces. Uh, former Senator Jane Cease and Representative Judy Bauman and uh, former Representative now Commissioner Lisa Nato, who I was uh, privileged to watch as they served in the Oregon legislature. So it's nice to see you again today. The movie The Perfect Storm has been mentioned lately 
as an appropriate analogy for what Oregon has been going through the last two years. I think it's a good analogy. Like the perfect storm, Oregon has been battered by an unprecedented convergence of events that have created challenges for our governor and legislature, the likes of which we have never seen before. Even before the disaster and horror of September 11th, we were seeing signs of a weakening economy, but 911 and the market crash that followed was particularly hard on Oregon. While we didn't face the brutal ground zero aftermath that New York did, the ripple effects through the national and world economies saw orders for goods and services plummet, Oregon's manufacturers laid off tens of thousands of workers, starting the cascade of revenue problems we now face. With lost revenues and intense media scrutiny came lost hope. The Portland School Board endured some of the toughest public forums and criticisms ever seen in this community. People were angry and wanted answers. But it was hard to explain how a sick economy can wreak havoc on those things we take for granted. Things such as a quality education, safe neighborhoods, and care for the most vulnerable among us. During the turmoil and following five special sessions, an election was held, and a new group of leaders took charge to make sense of the carnage left by the storm. Which brings us to where we are today. When this session started, the governor set the tone with themes of belt tightening and saying no to new taxes. As a priority, we were left to deal with one of the worst effects of the perfect storm. The emergency care package earlier we passed earlier this year took care of the most vulnerable seniors, mental health patients, and restored some funding to law enforcement. But contrary to the doomsayers, I firmly believe we can weather the storm and come out on top. I share the governor's optimism about Oregon's future. This is an opportunity for the legislature and the governor to prove to Oregonians that we can manage government and its growth. We must demonstrate that we can control costs just as they are forced to in these tough times, that we can reform PERS, preserve good schools, stabilize the Oregon health plan, and stimulate the economy. Just three months ago, Oregonians voted 60% to 40% against ballot measure 28. Despite an unprecedented free media campaign on the part of the Oregonian and other media across the state, voters still said no to higher taxes. Voters said no for many reasons, but I believe there are two main reasons why they did. Their incomes are down, and they have lost faith in their government's ability to manage their money. In a recent public opinion survey, 43% of voters said they believe government and efficiency is most responsible for the state's budget deficit. 24% cited too much government spending, and 18% cited the recession. The same survey also showed that 77% of Oregonians feel the state is on the wrong track, far, far higher than in previous surveys over the last 10 years. How do we regain the voters' trust? One of the best ways Oregon's elected leadership can regain the trust is to stop and listen to what the voters are saying. The public does not buy the argument that government doesn't have enough of their money. I think voters are trying to tell us something. Do a better job with the money we send you. I know we can do better. Although our current situation is painful, and I know it's terribly painful for many, we have an opportunity to put our fiscal house in order and build a foundation for a sounder and a better future. There are those who want to examine long-term tax reform first. Instead, I think we should put fix FERS, put the health plan back on its feet, and get the economy moving again. New taxes should be a last resort, not a first resort. The storm highlighted one of our weakest structural points, PERS. Reforming PERS is necessary to help restore trust with the electorate and to ensure the health of a retirement system that thousands of Argonians depend upon. With an unfunded liability of, 16 point, of more than $16.5 billion and payments that have gone up by more than 30% this year for some of our school districts and local governments, 
Hers is consuming more and more tax dollars at the expense of programs. It's important that public employees understand that PERS reform is not an attempt to single them out. PERS must be reformed to ensure the security of their retirement. At the state level, PERS is making our budget problems more acute. At a time when tax revenues are down, PERS payments are skyrocketing, leaving even fewer dollars that actually reach classrooms, police bureaus, and fire stations. Right now, PERS is costing government employers an average of 16.5% of their payroll. If we had done nothing this session, the average contribution rate was on track to grow to 26% of payroll within a few years. Everyone at the Capitol recognizes that this situa situation cannot continue. The House has already passed legislation that will dramatically reform the system and save state and local employers more than $1.1 billion during the next biennium. That is a direct savings for our schools, human services, and public safety. Let me put into perspective for you what PERS savings means to a local school district. The three PERS bills we have passed will save schools $433 million this next biennium. That means a savings of approximately $787 per student. For the Portland public school system alone, that means an estimated savings of $40 million. We've been able to make great progress on PERS despite the perception that the legislature and Republicans in particular are out to get public employees. Public employees work hard and provide the basic government services we all depend upon. The legislature, and especially Republicans, has also been accused of not caring about our teachers, or the kids. Of course, we care. Instead of placing blame, we need to realize that it's going to take all of us working together to find a funding solution for schools. We're not going to make real progress until we can remove the politics from this debate and truly focus on the kids and the quality of their education. Toward that goal, we're working this session to help schools control their costs so a greater share of school funding reaches the classroom. For example, we're looking at moving health benefits for school employees into a pool, something like the Public Employee Benefit Board. Currently, health benefits drive substantial costs in school districts. By moving teachers into a PEB-like system, we'd be able to gain the savings of a pooled benefit system. For example, Simply putting Portland school employees into a PEB-like system would have saved the district $10 million, money that it could have gone to the classrooms. Overall, my goal for education funding this session is to give schools certainty. I want to budget an amount they can count on and de then deliver the funding. In my conversations with superintendents, what they tell me they want more than anything is certainty. They don't want to have to face the prospect of us coming back in special session to cut their funding, and they don't want their fate tied to a ballot measure. The legislature and school districts across the state are doing the same things in this, these tough times. Cutting costs, re-examining programs, and doing business differently. It is a difficult exercise, but I believe it's one that will ensure less money goes to overhead and more money gets to the classroom. And I have confidence that the legislature, working with our governor, will be able to find a solution for education. I want to make it clear that I have great respect and admiration for our teachers and our volunteer school boards across the state. Here in Portland, I think Superintendent Jim Scherzinger and the board have made a heroic effort to turn the Portland schools around. Every member of the legislature, Republican and Democrat alike, urban and rural, have, made a, have a deep appreciation for our educators and what they do. We know they work hard to inspire and teach our children, and their dedication shows in the high test scores achieved by Oregon students. In addition to schools, one of the more visible consequences of the economic storm has been the erosion of the medical care provided under the Oregon Health Plan. Stabilizing the health plan this session is as important as anything else we do. As a health care provider for more than 430,000 Oregonians, we must ensure that it works as well as it possibly can. 
This is the first session where we've made a systematic review of the Oregon Health Plan, the first such reassessment since it began. Once we had the ability to look under its inner workings, we discovered serious problems. Too many people were in fee-for-service care, drug pur purchasing was uncoordinated, and our benefits packages were richer than neighboring states. In part, the exploding costs of care are beyond our control as health care costs rise and our population ages. But there are proactive steps we can take to better manage these costs. For example, we're going to require health care recipients to move from fee-for-service to managed care, serving at least 8%, saving at least 8% per patient. We're developing a bulk purchasing system for pharmaceuticals, and we're working to preserve access to cost-effective care in rural Oregon by expanding access to managed care. When we're done with this, this session, we expect these changes will allow us to preserve prescription drugs, <laughs> mental health coverage, alcohol and drug treatment, and durable medical goods for, the health, for all health plan recipients. Overall, the changes we're making to the plan will make its benefits package similar to, instead of more generous than, what's available in commercial health plans. However, the reforms we'll make this we make this session will provide little shelter from future storms if we can't get our economy working again. It's important to remember that our revenue fell because fewer people are paying income taxes and many Oregonians are earning much less money. Real economy, economic recovery cannot be purchased through higher taxes. It can only come by making Oregon an attractive place to do business. In February, I convened a job creation work group of business leaders to identify what we could do this session to help our economy. Their re research became the basis of the Oregon Economic Recovery Plan I announced last month. This plan includes refocusing the Oregon Economic and Community Development Department, making better use of Oregon's natural resources, repairing Oregon's roads and bridges, simplifying Oregon's permitting processes, enhancing investments in Oregon, and enhancing investments in higher education and higher technology. Oregon's economic recovery is directly tied to changing the way we do business. I think our governor understands this, and I'm committed to working with him to change the way we do things. New businesses aren't going to move here, and our existing businesses aren't going to expand if we don't start treating them as if we want them here. That's why it is critical that we make some basic changes, such as reforming our permitting processes so companies will have certainty as to when they can build and begin operating in Oregon. We need to focus the Oregon Economic and Community Development Department on helping businesses set up by shepherding through the regulatory maze that often intimidates investment in Oregon. We need to do a better job of managing our vast natural resources to provide more jobs, particularly in rural areas. We need to repair our roads and bridges, many of which have become unsafe, forcing delays into detours, especially for heavy trucks. There is consensus on this point, and we, we will provide more than a billion dollars to repair our roads and bridges and create thousands of construction jobs for several years. By the way, these are family wage jobs. I also support the governor's call for shovel-ready industrial lands. We need to make it easier for businesses to expand and locate in Oregon. The world needs to know that Oregon is open for business. A strong economy is the best foundation we can have for a stronger future. And we are all working together to make Oregon a better place to do business. A place where businesses want to be. This is a comprehensive package that will help create jobs in the rural and urban Oregon while making important structural changes that are needed to get Oregon back to work. Once we reform, once we reform PERS, preserve quality education, put the health pl plan back on stable footing, and address our economy, we can begin to talk about long-term tax reform. A good starting point for this discussion is focusing on what we can actually pass. But I, by that I mean pass the House, pass the Senate, and pass a vote of the people. I agree with our governor when he recently said, I do not define leadership by raising taxes. Taking a long, hard look at how government operates is never easy. Every program, no matter how seemingly inconsequential, has a constitu constituency and a lobbyist. 
but we're looking under every rock to make sure that we can put as much money as possible behind the most important functions of government. Despite the challenges we face, Oregonians should not despair. The state of Oregon is undergoing an adjustment similar to that which is occurring throughout the business community. While we may have made some painful cuts by reforming PERS, we will ensure that a greater percentage of taxes go towards programs instead of overhead. At the beginning of this session, I said that it was my hope that in years to come, future generations would be able to look back at this session and say, here was a time when despite seemingly insurmountable problems, our leaders moved beyond their differences and focused on what they had in common to build a better Oregon. I still believe we can accomplish this goal despite the occasional disagreement that attracts media attention, the House and Senate, Democrats and Republicans, and our governor are working closely together to find solutions to the problems we face. It's pity when the media focus on the negative because there are examples at the Capitol every day when members of both parties are working closely together to solve our problems, working together to make this state a better place. It is also important to keep in mind that our system of government is messy by design. It is supposed to foster lively debate. If our founding fathers had intended seamless power, they would have created a dictatorship. Our process works. I will have my disagreements with Senator President Courtney and our governor, but I have great respect for them both. And I'm confident that working together, we can weather the storm and get Oregon back on track as a leader in the nation, noted for the good things we are doing and not for our troubles. Thank you. The Speaker of the House of Representatives is a woman. The House Democratic Leader is a woman. And the Senate Republican and Democratic leaders are both women. Women now hold most of the top positions in the Oregon State Legislature. Madam Speaker, can you tell us how that has changed the leadership dynamic in Salem, especially considering the unique challenges that you're facing today? Well, if I remember Senator C, she used to say, I am woman, hear me roar, when she was in the building. <laughs> Actually, I think it's, it's, a, it's a very good dynamic. And uh, whether we're male or female, I think uh, Peter Courtney, the governor, uh, feels as if he's surrounded by some very competent individuals. We're all working well together. And uh, I think women tend to be a little more uh, consensus builder, if, if I may be so free as to say that. But uh, we are working together very well, and I will tell you that the relationship, while we may have sometimes philosophical disagreement, we talk through those issues uh, very well, and uh, sometimes agree to disagree uh, and move on to the next subject, or we can come together and we work it out. Uh, these next five weeks, five, six weeks, ought to offer some very challenging times, and I think the individuals that are at uh, the places of leadership in that process are very well skilled to help us get through this end of this session. Um, I, I appreciate your comments on, on fiscal responsibility and sit and doing more with the money that we, we send to Salem. My question is about House Bill 2892, which would require that Oregon state agencies at least consider using open source software, potentially saving tens of millions of dollars on the Tuesday's Oregonian, you had said that this bill is a solution looking for a problem, and yet, you know, the, the perfect storm, as you call it, is cutting days off of our school year, cutting people off of medical benefits, and cu cutting felons loose from our jails. It seems to me that this bill saving tens of millions of dollars is a, a solution that has found a problem. And I, I'm asking you, uh, please, for the sake of all Oregonians, will you bring this Will you bring this bill to the, to the House floor for an open debate? This, uh, this, my understanding is that we have the ability in administrative rule to move forward on open source software. And so we are right now focusing in on budget items, PERS, those kinds of issues. And it was my understanding when that issue was brought forward, it was past the deadline. 
as sometimes your debate is past the deadline, to have that issue raised. And that's why we did not move forward with it and uh, felt that we have the ability currently to go to open source software at the state. Mm -hmm. I do understand that we have the, that we're allowed to save money using open source software, but I, I think we ought to pass a bill that says we should actively consider using open source software, gi given that you, you're saying that we should look under every rock for savings. Um, I will tell you that the debate that I heard surrounding that very issue was unclear whether or not the savings that was purported was, was actually real. So there's a lot of debate going on right at the end of session. I'd, I'd love to see that on the House floor. All right, thank, thank you. you. Hi, uh, my name is Pavel Goberman. I'm a member of City Club and candidate for the U.S. Senate next year election. First, I would like to mention, he foot much better than foot at Multnomah Club. Uh, second, I want to talk about the uh, Oregon Constitution. In the Oregon Constitution, besides to balance budget, there no one word is about duty, responsibility, obligation of member of Oregon legislature. Mem many members of Oregon legislature ignore constitution, raping this constitution and no any punishment. Why? Could you, I'm sorry, I didn't understand the question. Would you mind repeating Many that? members of Oregon legislature include you, ignoring Oregon constitution in the United States constitution Raping this constitution, criminal contempt, and no any punishment. Why? I'm unclear what situation you're addressing, sir. Uh, my, my question is why Oregon lawmaker avoid uh, uh, responsibility, duty responsibility? No any law in Oregon constitution about duty, your duty, what's your duty responsibility as a member of legislature? Our duty is to uphold the Constitution of Oregon. Correct. It's have the, but it's not written. You know any punishment for this? There is, a, there is an oath, sir, that we do take when we're sworn into office, that it is our duty to uphold the Oregon Constitution, and we do abide under that rule. Oh, this isn't working, then. <laughs> this one does, I think. You want to come over here and uh, join me? Yeah. Uh, my question, I'm Ken Calvin, uh, City Club member. Uh, two general questions. One is, do you plan to support uh, re restoration of the Oregon Health Plan, including hospitalization uh, for the medically needy and the uh, Oregon Project Independence, those two? And the second part of the question is, the former governor, when he left office, suggested that the methodology, that the legislature generally was not a very effective way to solve our problems here in Oregon. That it's a wonderful form of entertainment, but that it doesn't really uh, make the kind of difference that it costs and so on. And he's gone off to take things to a more uh, popular, personal level. Do you, how do you feel about that, that his idea or his thoughts about that? So are you saying that he would like to abolish the legislature? I don't think he said, he said that, but I know a lot of us spend a lot of time talking about money and how to get more money, and we don't talk about solving Oregon's problems. That just doesn't seem to be important. What's important is getting more money to keep doing what we've been doing with no examination of what we've been, whether what we've been doing is a good thing to do. Uh, we, I think, have done an unprecedented search this session and it, if it seems as if uh, things have uh, are moving a little slower they probably are because we've had two budgets this session coming in that we needed to balance which presented some terrific challenges in regard to the medical medically needy and the OPI and the health plan in particular we're doing uh, we're examining doing things we have providers of services that are stepping up uh, that would be uh, assisted living facilities, uh, owners of them that are willing to assess a fee on themselves in order to get the Medicaid match to bring stability to that whole senior population. And in doing that, we hope to derive enough dollars to assist with OPI, Oregon Project Independence. Uh, so those are certain components that we are addressing, yes. Yeah, my name is Marsden Smith. I'm a member of the City Club. And um, it's been, my wife is talking about the women. My wife is a woman, 
And, um, and all these gentlemen here that are married also have women as wives. And I think mo I can speak for most of them that we don't, or consensus is unknown in our, our own households. And so, but, but anyway, but my, I have two questions, and it's unrelated to anything that you've mentioned, but it has to do with the, sta the baseball stadium. And now, at the beginning of your speech, you said that the, the voters need to be convinced that um, our, our, our legislators are better able to spend their money. So why, what was the thinking in the House that, that, they would, uh, that they would manage our money better by approving a stadium plan? And then secondly, regarding the stadium plan, you know, 100% of the income tax, I guess, of the players and the, and the, the managers <coughs> or will go to pay the stadium, so that means the, the increased burden on, for, on the school systems, on law, ma on, on, on law enforcement, et cetera, is going to have to be borne by the rest of the citizens. So although it's true that there's not a penny will be taken away from any other fun, uh, any of the other um, needs of the state, the, the balance of the state will have to fulfill the need that the income tax on these players won't be available for. Thanks. Thank you for the question. You know, we, the case was made that this, this project would make, make for some jobs in this state and that the, the attraction that a, that a uh, big league team would bring to the state from outside individuals coming into the state to buy our goods, to attend the games, uh, would attract more dollars into Oregon. So that's, that's the case they made, jobs and uh, people coming into Oregon to spend the resources. Uh, my name is Paul Milius, and I'm a club member. I had not intended to uh, address the stadium issue, but I, in the back of my mind, I see the law of unintended consequences. We're going to tax ball players, but you know, if five or six years from now they decide this is not a market and the team moves again, then we're going to be stuck paying off those bonds because there won't be any ball players to tax. Anyway, uh, but I have in my pocket here my ballot for, which includes measure 2648. And frankly, I'm going to vote to support it hold my nose and do so, not that I want to increase my taxes, but I regard the fact that we have to vote on this as a failure of the legislature to stand up and, and address the problems of our tax system, which were foisted on us by Measure 5 and Measure 50, among other decisions that were made and, uh, and so on. I'd like, uh, you referred very briefly to tax reform. Uh, some weeks ago, the City Club put out a tax reform study uh, which we worked on for four years. I hope you have had a chance to read it, but I'd like your, uh, some additional comments from you on what you think uh, are ways that uh, we should be proceeding to reform this tax structure that relies so heavily on income tax. It's been an interesting uh, dynamic in Salem, and I'm glad you've asked the question. We have a governor who has really asked us to not move forward on on a tax referral right now. He feels the timing is bad. Uh, we have folks that want to move forward. We have a ballot measure on. We have uh, May 15th will tell us what our revenue forecast looks like. There are individuals that are bringing forth a myriad of, of suggestions. We need to address the short term first. And so we are working on that, trying to meet the needs that are currently right before us. And then once we do that, we'll have the discussion over the long term. But there is a diverse view in the Capitol today as to whether this is the right time, particularly if the ballot measure that's going to be voted on on the 20th passes or fails. People feel like all of that uh, will have an impact. So we are right now addressing the short term, and then we'll, we'll turn our attention as to whether or not this is the time for a long-term uh, solution with the voters. I'm Ray Polani, a City Club member. I don't think there's any question that Oregon and Oregonians must be evolving and progressing. And I think the time has come we must not be the enemy, we must be part of the solution. In that spirit, uh, remembering how important efficient transportation is to a healthy economy. Uh, you mentioned roads and bridges, but I would hope that we're not limiting ourselves to roads and bridges in transportation. Railroads are equally important, if not more, and so is transit in our cities. Unfortunately, the funding for those has to come from general funds, lottery, and whatever else. Don't you think that it's the time to review our constitutional restriction, which 
uh, funds highways only. Are you in favor of asking the voters of Oregon to over, to review this anachronistic restriction and transform the highway trust fund into a general transportation fund where all modes of transportation will be funded equally? Are you in favor? Uh, is the legislature in favor of this? I think the time is now. Thank you for your question. We are currently examining the highway transfer, uh, transportation fund. Uh, the governor would like to put a penny gas tax and open that up to fund our state police in that. But th there has not been a plan brought forward to the legislature, and I don't think we are looking at opening the whole debate on that particular fund. Uh, that would take a vote of the people, because right now they are um, very clear about where they want those monies to go to. But that you know, may be something that's an interim study that we can look at and see if our highway dollars are being used at, at the, in, in the best way that we know. I'm Tom Welch, a City Club member. Thanks for coming today. I, uh, for myself, I, I find your remarks uh, um, long on, on aphorism um, and short on uh, substance. Um, Oregonians should not despair I, I take issue with that. Um, I have one specific question for you. Um, Oregonian spoke uh, very clearly in the November election about an increase in the uh, minimum wage with indexing uh, in the future. Um, I understand that uh, the House has passed a bill and sent it to the Senate removing the indexing feature. I'm interested to know what your position on that is and uh, how you could justify the House action in the face of Oregon's, uh, Oregonians having spoken. We have, we have uh, businesses that were going to be laying people off on the indexing point. They said it would run businesses out of the state. Our low, our, our small uh, employers, people with small businesses across the state said they could not sustain an automatic increase. They would, it would force them to f hire fewer individuals to do the job. Uh, I have a, a company in East Multnomah County, Towns and Farms, who said it would shut them down if we have an automatic increase. So weighing, weighing those, those different choices, we did make the choice to take the automatic, the CPI uh, away. We, we, of course, kept the, the increase in place. But that was some of the things we weighed in that debate. Hi, Clyde Doctor, a City Club member. Uh, you've mentioned a pretty challenging list of uh, uh, policy issues that, that face the legislature. Um, you've got PERS reform and, and uh, funding education and uh, income ta or the tax reform. Um, but it strikes me that all those issues have been in front of the legislature for 20 or more years. I worked for the legislature back in the 70s, and frankly, the conversation <laughs> hasn't changed very much. Uh, my question is, isn't it time for some legislative reform so we can have a legislature that act, can actually deal with broad, long-range issues, perhaps um, a more professional legislature or annual terms? That's a, that's a, would you like a full-time legislature? Yeah. <laughs> it is, uh, that, is a that is an interesting point of view. We have had some legislation uh, this session to look at uh, annual sessions. Uh, legislators currently get paid about 1200 and I think it's $1,238 a month. Uh, and in order to sustain that, you know, you would have to get serious, but because they are part-time and it's something that they do meet every other year, uh, it would depend on what the or uh, how Oregonians felt about that. And I think right now we have, uh, we're kind of getting mixed reviews. But I will agree that the issues are becoming much more complex and uh, we are one of a few that meet biennially. So it would be something that should be re explored. I don't know if that's something we get to this, this session to be resolved, because we have lots of things we're trying to fix. But maybe in the future uh, we can examine that. But that would require us to be in Salem full time. Gil Johnson, City Club member. 
Um, it seems like, um, and let me correct me if I'm wrong on this, but Republicans generally tend to run on a platform that says we really don't need to have new taxes. We can always get more efficiency in government, and that's been happening for 10 years, and you've been in, or at least 10 years, many years, many years. Uh, but the Republicans have been basically in control of the legislature for the last 10 years, so why isn't government by now a lean machine? You guys have had 10 years to do it. But that's not my question. Uh, <clears throat> that's not fair. Now, well, you can answer that. The question is, uh, the governor's come out with a bud that, uh, with um, the, he was mandated to uh, propose an education budget, uh, not a, you know, at least tell what is required for a quality education in Oregon, and it comes out a little over $6 billion. As I understand it, the legislature isn't even going to meet $5 billion, so we have a, at least a billion dollar shortfall. Do you honestly think you can do this by making efficiencies in the educational system, or are we going to have to raise taxes? And if we don't raise taxes, does that mean we're at other cities and school districts in Oregon are going to be showing up in Doonesbury next year. Okay. The education issue, uh, one of the things we have been able to uh, do, we we're doing some extraordinary things this session. One of the things we found in going through our budget process is we have 6,700 full-time employee posi vacant positions that are currently held in state government. They are each funded at the amount of about $60,000. These resources are going into the state agencies, but they're not filling the positions. So we're, we are identifying those dollars to capture them and to put them in other places. Uh, we have been in the process, in the co-chair's budget, they identified 800 of those. They felt that was a conservative amount. Uh, in order to cap take that money out from the state agencies, that saves us, just for 800 positions, $50 million. We need to finish the process of going through and looking at the rest of these uh, vacancies that they are receiving funds for. If you even take 2,000 of those, or 1,500 of those, by the way, the legislature is part of those vacancies, uh, so they, there are reasons to have vacancies in the state budget. But we need to take those kinds of steps, and I did pull, pull the money where it's being used for other purposes, and you can capture those kind of resources and you can put it over here in education. Another issue we're looking at is uh, reserves. This is a other fund reserve, which has usually kind of been sitting over here because it's not general fund. People have not scrutinized those, those dollars very closely. This session, uh, we are taking a very close look at agencies that have, lar some are very large. Uh, why are we cutting programs if you're sitting on reserves? There, there's some